Well, I guess one thing you should know for for those of you who haven't listened to Levi the Poet is that his first few albums were, you know, they were basically track after track uh, about, you know, different different things. Mostly very personal. A lot of very personal stuff is basically Levi just opening his heart to to everyone. By the way, Levi's full name is Levi McAllister. Uh, not sure if I... I should probably clarify that. He's not just Levi the Poet. But yeah, that was like all of his albums from Werewolves to Monologues to Seasons. Seasons was a really great album. But in my opinion... I think his his best work is his album Correspondence. Now, Correspondence is a very different album because he decided he wanted to tell a story with this album. That wasn't his. He wanted to write a piece of work that told a story about someone else that tells, doesn't exist, a fictional story. And I, I really like how he talks about, and and also it just like it feels different than his other albums. It's it's a lot more calmer. Uh, a lot of his his previous albums, there is a lot of screaming. So I, I I can understand how he was very popular in the in like the metal hardcore scene because there was that kind of element. But this was different. There was it was more just like telling a story. He still is very like emotive in his in the way that he delivers the, the stories but but it was very different and and the music also is you know is different as well the 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 sort of like background music that goes along well i i don't want to say background music it, it is a craft it does come together as like one piece of art it's not like that he's just talking over background music it it weaves in together very well and i love this album definitely it's most likely in like top 20 albums for me there's no other album that i know that's that's like it and it's just beautifully written and he goes into on the doc documentary what it was like because he actually had some insecurities about it and and i never really thought about it before and we're gonna watch a just i'm just gonna play a clip it's a bit it's it's a bit long, so maybe I'll like cut in every so every so often. But he talks about how that was kind of he was very nervous about it because it was so different. And but you know, I'll just I'll just let him talk. Yeah. So so moving from seasons into correspondence was very odd, scary, and freeing, life giving to me at the same time. Up until that point, I had never released something that wasn't autobiographical or more of like journal entry kind of thing. And so I was afraid that maybe the audience, whoever was attracted to what I was doing thus far, I was nervous that maybe, sorry, one, that they wouldn't just um, my face here. like <laughs> what I was wanting to do with correspondence. But then two, I, I've always thought and been far too concerned about what other people are thinking of me. Uh, that's a, a thing that I know and that I'm, I'm trying to do less of, but there was a fear, especially with the amount of more kind of like missional and evangelical work um, and, and kind of like gospel presenting stuff that I had done up until the point in time that correspondence was a thing, that it made me nervous that since this was so very different, perhaps the perception was going to be, oh no, Levi is moving away from something and we can no longer support him. And I've watched that happen to a lot of bands and a lot of artists, so it's not entirely unfounded, but it was it was definitely something that apparently in the end didn't scare me enough to shy me away from doing the project as I ended up doing it. But I had a lot of conversations with people during the entire lead up to the Kickstarter and then the release date. I remember when I very first started to 
consider the idea that correspondence was. Um, I remember being on the road at that time and we were listening through this series of lectures given by uh, a pastor in New York named Timothy Keller and their church hosted this thing called the I, I will Arch say that if this is the Timothy Keller that I'm thinking of, I'm not a huge fan of Tim Keller and his some of his stances on uh, like critical race theory and all that. But, you know, not to say that he's not a brother. He may be. I don't really know a whole lot about him. But I, I will say I do like what he says here. Fellowship. And he was he was just a sense, he was talking about art and he was talking about the way that different people approached art and he was specifically loving the way that Tolkien approached his art mythologically with the Lord of the Rings talking about the inherent goodness of a story as a thing that can exist and point in the direction of truth without having to be explicit about it because it can just be a good thing in and of itself. At the same time, I was listening to a series of lectures from RTS down in Florida about C.S. Lewis and the way that beauty was what he could not reconcile with his unbelief. And that was fascinating to me because all growing up, I, I, I loved me. I mean, certainly a lot of my childhood played into this because I... I loved music, I loved what it did to me, I loved the way that it seemed to point me in the direction of the creator of that beauty, which is exactly what C.S. Lewis was describing at the time, and exactly what Tolkien was articulating in the inherent goodness of a story, without having to basically like Bible bash people over the head with what the actual message ended up being. And they actually didn't like one another's art. Well. Tolkien never cared as much for Lewis's art because he thought that it was too on the nose, that the analogies were too obvious, and he wanted the narrative to be buried even deeper. All of that to say, it resonated with my spirit because growing up, my dad would always ask me, like, why? He, he, always, he asked why a lot. And, and if it was music I was listening to, he wanted to know why, and he wanted to know what I got out of the lyrics, and he wanted to know if what I was getting out of the lyrics was appropriate, if it was good or bad, if I was guarding my heart, et cetera, et cetera. But I never, I never remember viewing things quite in quite as binary a way where I was a lot more comfortable with a lot more things. And this felt almost like the permission that I needed to be able to say, I can create something that's beautiful. That in and of itself can be an act of worship. I don't need to explicitly articulate every single facet of the gospel story that I thought that I needed to in order to just make something that might be just as truthful as, as it would have been if it was some literal interpretation given to an audience's ears. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, so one so second. moving from seasons into correspondence. Sorry, I just needed to do something really quick. Um, so, yeah, I... I, there's a whole lot of that that I, I just completely resonate with. And I think I think there's a lot of that that's really lost in not just Christian music, but just Christian entertainment in general. I want to preface this that I, I do, I completely agree that there is an importance and a value in presenting the gospel in our art. There's a lot of artists that do that, that I really appreciate. It kind of depends on how they do it because there are artists out there who have made it their goal to, to emphasize the gospel in their message. And they do a wonderful job at it because they care about their craft and they know that that's, that's important, that if we want to share the gospel to non-believers, that, you know, we can't do it half-heartedly, you know? there There's people like Josh Garrels who, you know, every song is like a, a, a gospel message or, or, or worship to God. An artist like, like Keith Green, you know? But... I also think that there's an importance. I mean, 
I think we've there's something that we've lost and something that we used to value like back in the historical times, you know, that conservatives seemed to value so much. Art was so different back then where yeah, you had your artists who gave glory to God by presenting something about like from the gospel or the Bible. But you also had artists who who loved God and but all they really wanted to do was make a beautiful piece of work whether it be a whether it be music or or a painting or a sculpture and and that was their worship and that's how they gave glory to God not because i mean and they they didn't need they didn't feel the need just like Levi to have every single facet of the gospel presented in their piece. And I'm not saying that like either or that we need to have one and not the other. I think both are great. And I think that that's something that we're, we've kind of lost where we don't appreciate we a lot of Christians don't appreciate good art anymore because they're looking for they're waiting for someone to say the name of Jesus or something is like say Jesus in your music or say Jesus from the stage you know whatever but it's like i think there's a there's a purpose for for both of those things i think both can can bring people to Christ you know um I mean, yeah, I think that, that Christian artists that maybe decide not to put Jesus in every single song or preach Jesus from the stage, I think they should be open about their faith at least and, you know, like live by example so that people who maybe just hear their songs on the radio and they and they may not be believers and they listen to their music and they're like, oh, this is like actually, this is well-crafted music and I really like this. I want to find out more about the artist and they find out that they're, a Christian and that and they find out that they're, you know, may hopefully doing their best to live a good life, uh, a life of example, and that can bring people to Christ as well. I think both are, are very important and, and I love that approach that Levi took with this album. And yeah, it's it's not preachy or anything. It's just him writing a good story and him crafting a good album, you know. I and I, and I'm I've talked about this before. I had a whole video on like whether artists, uh, you know, like singers or whatever who are Christians, um, whether they need to be Christian artists. And I go into more into what I mean in the video, but like I gave a few examples. Like I know I talk about Keith Green a lot, but like if you read Keith Green's biography that his wife wrote they talk about how they they were planning on making an album that wasn't um that wasn't like a christian album it was going to be more accessible to non-believers for the purpose of pointing them to christ where like all the songs were going to be more about like raising questions rather than answering them and I think that they never did because Keith Green tragically died in the plane crash. But I think that that's totally, totally cool for someone to do that. And and he brought brought up the example of like Tolkien and Lewis. And yes, Lewis was a bit more on the nose about his faith. But the Chronicles of Narnia are like, they're famous not just with Christians, but with many other people. And there are even some people who have surprisingly been like, oh, wow, I never realized that this, like these were, you know, that, uh, that this was supposed to be like Christian or whatever, that these had uh, a lot of the symbolism was Christian or whatever. Not, not an allegory. Lewis never really liked the term allegory for his books, but but yeah, and then like Lord of the Rings, even more accessible to a lot of people. And yeah, they're not as like uh, upfront with like, you know, you really have to go digging to find some of the Christian symbolism. Like there is actually a God figure in the Lord of the Rings. It, it, they just don't really talk about it. And, well, in like the world of Middle Earth, 
they don't really talk about it in Lord of the Rings, but there is a God figure. But you really have to go digging and looking uh, to find that in Tolkien's work. And there's so there's so many fans of Lord of the Rings that aren't Christians. Almost like it's almost kind of a bad thing because now like I feel like studios have been like they they've been taking a hold of it and not doing its due diligence. But anyways, enough about Lord of the Rings. But I think those are perfect examples of pieces of art. They are fiction, but they're pieces of art that may not be so upfront about the gospel, but have still brought people, they've still been able to point people to Christ in, in some way. Maybe not always successfully, but you know, that's kind of up to the Holy Spirit. Hey, so I don't know if you guys know this, but what you just watched was basically just a clip of a full podcast episode of my podcast, The I'm Clifford Today Show. So you should just go check out that whole episode. Also, while you're at it, you might as well like the video and subscribe to my channel. You know, that'd be really nice. I mean, you're nice people, right? Okay.